Yo, boom, here we are, back for more. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. What's going on? I hope everybody's uh, recovered from the uh, the last show, the, the Dave Dictor show. Holy, holy, holy mackerel. Whew. That was something else. Great. That was a great show. And we're back. What's up, Ray Hogan? What's happening? Gary, what's up, bro? Human brisket, absolutely still screaming. Yep. Yep. Hey, Philip. What's happening? Scotland checking in. How you doing, Robert? Yes. What's up? What's good? Mark, are you coming back to New York at any point? Hey, there he is. Jeff Kaplan to man advantage this weekend at the Bowery Electric. You guys practicing, Jeff? You guys getting it together? Hey, Ray, what do you say? Good to see you. Larry Kelly, my man. Mr. Wolf, there he is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for Lenny's 50th. Right. Okay, good. I'll see you there at that. What's up, Lex? All right. Yes, Sunday. Every, everybody's on the guest list on Sunday. Of course, we're, we're talking about uh, right here. We're talking about this Sunday at the Bowery Electric. It is two-man advantage. Uh, playing the first New York show in five years. Enziguri featuring Davey the Hooligan. Fuck It, I Quit featuring Tim Ensign. Non Residence featuring a whole bunch of crazy dudes. And, uh, you know, Chris Iconicide and Iconicide. Spike Polite is DJing. This is going down this Sunday at the Bowery Electric. So. What's up, Mio? What's going on, man? There you go. That said, I think every that was a wild show. We that last show we did was wild, man. <laughs> that was that was really that was something else, you know? Right? Oh yeah, that show was great. That it was great. I, he was he was it was just like it. You just kind of turned a fan on, and you were like getting blown back. It was great. He was he was so much positivity. I loved it. Yeah, he was good, man. Yeah, great, great. I'm looking forward to those uh those GBH MDC shows are gonna be insane. He just sent me it's like so. the, G, GBH is going out and doing like oh, like 40 dates, man. Oh yeah. They're doing the Amityville Music Hall. That's gonna be crazy. Yeah, that's pretty wild. GBH, GBH that, in that little room is gonna be nuts. That's kind of a great spot to see him, you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'll be there for sure. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, definitely okay. looking forward to that. So, absolutely. Oh man, and Sunday is going to be awesome too. Sunday's yeah, going to be great. The uh, two man non residents. Non residents um, are always fun, man. You know. Oh my God, those guys are a riot. Love they those really guys. are. They're, and yeah. and the, the nicest, the nicest guys you could possibly meet. You know. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. Uh, oh man. Is that right? GBH is coming to SLC. Is that Salt Lake City? Is that right? Probably. I think GBH, I think GBH is playing every mar every major market in, in, yeah, I mean, in America. Yeah, it's, it's a you know? it's a long list. That's a long list of tour dates they're doing. So those guys are they're relentless. I saw I first saw GBH in 1987 on the No Need to Panic tour, and they were amazing back then. You know. You, you know, I have never seen GBH. Really. I've never that, seen GBH. That is where the, the famous photo that you and I, you know, of Danny Lilker sitting with the GBH guys. Right. That's where that was from. What's up, from Donald? That. So. Cropsy represent. Uh, that said, let's do photo of the day. You know, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know. I don't know if we should, you know, do wrong answers only, please, on this one. Maybe we, you know, it might be inappropriate. You know? I hear you. Uh, ah, here you go. Nice. Photo of the day. And at first I was like, you know what? I was going to say, you know what, dude? We're doing a hardcore show. Send right. some fucking hardcore. At least send some crappy ass, one of those, you know, send some crappy ass punk or metal band that you go see. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know. So, yeah. Let Listen, I th I think I think uh, th this man and his music crossed all sorts of boundaries musically. You know, 
And obviously, we're looking at Chris Cornell. This was Webster Hall, 2009, one of his solo tours. Uh, Soundgarden was as, honestly, as heavy as any metal band, as raw as any hardcore band at times. And, you know, and they were a Beatlesque when they wanted to be. So, you know, I, I don't know anyone who really doesn't like them. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, it's interesting. It's like all the gals are like, it's Chris Cornell, a beautiful <laughs> man. Rest in peace, best vocalist ever, you know? And all the dudes are like, yeah, like, whatever with this guy, you know? He, you Matt, know what? I, you know, Matt, you know? <laughs> I, I honestly believe he, he was definitely one of the greatest singers, like, yeah, you he, know, he, in, he, he, just an amazing, amazing singer. And I got to see him in, in all of his incarnations, in Audio Slave and Soundgarden, Solo and Temple the Dog. What a what a huge loss he was when he died. It was really a terrible thing. And I saw you know that first Audio Slave album is really good. Oh, phenomenal! Yeah, yeah, it's really. I'll give, I'll give him that. That first Audio Slave album, it's it's like Chris Cornell singing for Rage Against the Machine. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, really it, good. It must it's, have been amazing for them to go from like basically a rapper to a guy with like the biggest range, you know and yeah, you know, and to sing like you know, so not every song is about, you know, somebody imprisoned against their will somewhere. Like you know, it was a little more rock and roll. You know, you stabbed me in the back. I trusted you. <laughs> I trusted you. But, you stabbed uh, me in the back. I'm yeah, real. No, I'm real. Uh, You're fake. But I love Rage Against the Machine too, so I can't. And I would never speak ill of that. You know, they. uh you know, to me, when you had the probably the tightest band on the planet at the time, combined with the greatest singer, like it was, it was a perfect match. Yeah, yeah, he was he was great. And you know what? This was a two night run he had done there, and you know back then, and uh, awesome, just an awesome, awesome Le singer, Lex awesome says, band. Lex says I got tangled up in his hair once when he did a stage dive, and I had to hit him <laughs> in the back of the head to get him away from me. Oh my God. Yeah. That's funny. I remember yeah. him. I remember Soundgarden and Monster Magnet playing at Roseland. And he swam. He jumped off the stage and basically crowd swam all the way to the end and back and was just screaming because he was getting literally like groped to pieces. <laughs> like it's amazing. Like by the time he got back uh, to the stage, he was alive. That's a good, you know? that's a good name for a hardcore band. Groped to pieces. No, or just grope. Groped. Grope. We're, we're grope. That's it. <laughs> we're grope. Oh man. Yeah. But uh, you know, I saw I saw um, Soundgarden here in. Um, they played the Armory on Lexington Avenue. I was Avenue. there. Yep. Two nights they did. You know what? I went, and you want to know something? Yeah. It sucked. I knew you were gonna say something like it that. It sucked. All right, you happy now? It sucked. Well, you know what I remember about that show? The air conditioning didn't work. It, it just—it was horrible. It was no. And, and you know what? I'm not blaming it particularly on Soundgarden. But right. The whole—it was like they did a show at this armory. It was horrible. The, the, That's the only the time I've ever been there. The acoustics were terrible. There was no air conditioning. It was a, like a summer night. They sounded horrible. It was you're suffering to be in there. It was just. It, I didn't say they suck. I, said I know what you're it, saying. It sucked. The sound you didn't like. You know, the, the, my one memory of that show is my girlfriend at the time got kicked in the head by a stage diver, and when I brought it to the side, they they said, "Oh, we'll take you." They put you over here, and there was like a nurse right next to the side of the stage in the uh -huh. backstage, and she sat there with ice on her head. And I had like the best spot for like six, seven songs. And she's like, oh, I'm okay to get up now. I'm like, no, no, you, you should sit a while. You're good. You stay right there. And I got to see like a good portion of the show from like a really good vantage point. So, but that, was, a, that, that was a good on show. On a lighter I, note, yeah. on a lighter note, I see you're playing a, what is it? Is this an acoustic show? Yes, actually, this is very cool. Uh, our friend Will Romeo. Uh, from Anzaguri and Next Scars invited us 
along with Davey Hooligan from Enziguri and the Reverend Nikki Bullets from the Car Bomb Parade. And uh, it's a bunch of hardcore guys, but it's an acoustic show. And it's at our favorite vegetarian restaurant, the Organic Grill. It's a free show, and it's going to be awesome. Really looking forward to it. Honored to be a part of it. And uh, New York Hardcore Chronicles and Women. We have a the show. Family. We we have a show that day, but you guys don't start playing until. Oh, where are you playing that day? Uh, it's called the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Uh, we're, we're about to do the 250th show. Oh, and we do yes. It, I've and heard we do of it that. on Sundays. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Well, you know what? I'll probably be doing it from there. I'll probably get there early and just and just broadcast right from there. So, Bro, you're not going to be there at 3 o'clock in the fucking afternoon. What are you, fucking freak? Are you, do you have to ask? I'm the guy that likes to get there early to make sure the building is still standing if we're playing yeah, that Yeah, day. I'm going to get there five hours before we play. Yeah. <laughs> Don't dare me. I'll do it. I'll do it. Shut up, you freak. <laughs> I'll show up at your doorstep. We'll do it there. We'll God. do it in the same room. I don't but, like, uh, I, you know what? I like to show up one hour before we play. Unless are you, it's a uh, unless it's a battery electric thing, then I need to be there hours before and I need to go up and down the stairs about three hundred times to the point to the point that, you know, I'm I'm like I, I'm the guy that for years, the day of a show at like seven AM, the guys in my band are like are you pacing in front of the club yet? Exactly. Because I'm always that guy that I, I have to get there just to make sure the building is still there. You know, I, it's just someone has to do it. All right, brah. I'll let you get All back right. to, uh, you know, to, to All distributing. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll let you get back to distributing supplies. Listen, you know what? In case you need any, 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 uh, any uh, pure nickel special, fuck I got it. Fuck is that? You put it inside the lock so they don't freeze. I got it all. <laughs> all right, I'll talk to you later. 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 That's right. What's going on with my hat? It thinks it's a green screen? Wow. What's up with that? That's new. How weird is that? Thinks it's and why is it why is it brick? Do I have a choice in that? As to let me look. Do I have my choice in the green screen? No, I don't think so. Wow, that's weird. All right. I'm in the Matrix. Yeah, it's weird. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Edit again. And we are sponsored by The Organic Grill, New York Hardcore Comics, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Generation, excuse me, Upstate Records, and the one, the only, Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. The client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rolay, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook page and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Looking for extreme music? DTFM Vinyl has got you. Located on 13th Ave in Fargo, North Dakota, we have the state's best selection of punk, hardcore, metal, ska, oi, and more. Can't make it in? Shop online from anywhere in the country at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com. DTFM Vinyl, where the policy still is, and always will be death to false metal. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest on. You bloody okay? No, dr no drama going on? Let's bring our guest on. Here we go. Hold on. Let me clear the deck here. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Today's guest is an American musician and songwriter hailing from Bailey's Crossroads, Virginia. He's known for his work with the bands Spring Gun, Fallout Shelter, Tommy Models, Rise Defy, Soylent Green, Sky Church Talent Review, and for over 40 years multiple and multiple records on Discord, Scream. Please welcome, coming at us from Troy, New York, 
Mr. Skeeter Enoch Thompson. Hey, man. Hey, what's going on, dude? How are you, buddy? So far, so good. How's things up in Troy? Ah, uh, cold. Cold. Yeah. That's where we're in Albany right now. I live in, uh, just, I, I was living in Troy, but uh -huh. I moved to a place called West Sand Lake, but uh, I hail all the musical stuff here in Albany, which is a, which is the capital of New York. I mean, yeah, that is, you know, when I think of, when I think of, you know, Troy, I think, I think of this guy right here, man. Oh, no yeah. doubt. <laughs> Mr. Riley. Yeah. yeah. Bob Riley. You know? When I first came here, he was like so hospitable. He like invited me over and, uh, you know, gave me the lay of the land and told me I was always welcome at the Eagle club, which is a nice little private, Establishment, which I'm sure you know about. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's one of the greats, man. Oh, dude, he's so awesome, man. He's got yeah. every bit of memorabilia from every like from Horace to hardcore. He's got a he's got an incredible heart, man. He's he's a, he's a great guy. Oh yeah, Lo love that guy. The teddy bear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let's chop it up a little bit. Um, you know, we'll 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 we'll, we'll bounce the ball back and forth. Uh, did you grow up in a musical household? How did music come into your life? Ah, uh, wow. That's kind of, it's yeah. See, my mom, I grew up in a very uh, colorful environment. But, you know, uh, pretty much like a, a, a group house, which uh, with my godfather, my mom, and cousin, it was like, pretty much like four families that lived in one house and, and they would have, uh, and we would help people who were less fortunate and we'd have like community, like rent parties to help people like when they couldn't make the rent. And we would, uh, she'd always have card games and they would have card games and stuff. And with that, it's always a little libation and lots of music. And I grew up listening to my uncle Chummy who <laughs> played, uh, who played, you know, slide guitar, him and his, uh, him and like a few other of their friends would sit around through the night on weekends and play through the night. But, I, you know, my mom would always listen. My, my, neither of my parents were musically inclined, but they were, right. you know, they loved music, you know. I grew up yeah. listening to like Elmore James and stuff. My mom would, Ooh. <laughs> like, now, we're, now we're talking Dust yeah, we'll Dust, grow, my, Dust grow up my Room. Listening. Dust yeah, that's my brother. What's I up, you, brother? That, yeah, I mean, I would wake up like every Saturday. We'd wake up and she pretty much, you know, do the chores. My Elmore James. Was, Elmore James was. Uh, he's a man. Yeah, man. That that uh, bottle, that slide guitar he would, that he played, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. And that was I was a little kid, you know. I remember like doing dust my broom, like cleaning up. Yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't like really work. It was great. You know, it was work, but it was fun work. So. Elmore James, Elmore James really set it off, man. He that's like who like the Rolling Stones, Brian Jones, Brian Jones and all them. Like Elmore James was a huge influence on like uh, early yeah. Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, all that stuff. You know? Oh, yeah. But, you know, to me, I, I was I was just, you know, some of my earliest memories, like four or five. Yeah. You know, cause they would have these little soirees like just about every other weekend. Yeah. And so it. You know, that was how my mom got got ready for the people coming over and stuff like that. Elmer James, what a lot, Sonny, Sonny, Sonny Williams, mm -hmm. on down the line. Uh, looking out says, "What's happening, Enoch? Hope to see you soon, cousin D. Glad I caught this. Well, <laughs> not sure who I'm not sure who that is, but welcome yeah. to the show. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, um, what what was like? Um, and at, at what point did did uh, sort of did you pick up an instrument or or? I was pretty I was pretty much a jock, you know. I, lived, I grew up in the ghetto of uh, Bell's Cross. So never, you know, it's really where the garden apartments. You know, grew up Section Eight. Uh, so it was, you know, and hip hop was really big. But I was more into rock and roll. But I was playing. I was really into sports, really. And that was going to be my way out. But then, you know, I saw a movie on Jimi Hendrix and and the rest is history. I pretty much I was about 16, probably around no more like 14. And I pretty much 
connive my baseball coach into getting me a guitar and almost, you know, I, my first guitar was a Strat, <laughs> you know, got a Strat guitar when I was 14 or 15, started wow. taking lessons. So I taking lessons, met Franz, Franz Stahl, when we were in our seventh, eighth grade. I think he was in seventh, I was in eighth. So you guys, you guys went, you guys went to uh, uh, school together? The, yeah, we went the, to Gladys, the, the school the, called- Stahl Brothers? Well, Pete, Pete was older, Pete is older. He's like three years older. Okay. And Franz, two years older than me, something like that. And uh, so he he was already in the high high school area. But Franz, I met Franz. Uh, I guess he was in seventh grade, and I was in eighth grade. Yeah, intermediate, a, a school called Glasgow Intermediate. Mm. And uh, you know, we just you know, I saw him carrying a guitar around. He had like a SG. The double cutaway joint, you know, yeah, like the yeah. Batman guitar. Uh -huh. And he, he was all in, like, uh, you know, I was doing the air, like Ted Nugent and all that shit. And he was all in the Almond Brothers, you know. <laughs> he had the Dutch boy haircut, and he's like, it was fucking badass. You know, he played slide guitar, and I was like, in awe of him. And I was just learning how to play, you know, just learning about guitar, you know, before I was always in awe. Of, you know, I was more in the bands, like, not even bands. I was, in the usual Motown songs and groups, I mean, and like, you know, Jackson 5, of course, Barquets and bands like that. But uh, but I started getting into rock and roll and, you know, mm -hmm. later age. And I met Franz in seventh to eighth grade and we headed off by, by I'd say, by ninth grade. We were already, you know, we were already talking about <laughs> starting a band. And How far? How how uh, Bailey's Crossroads? How far is that from from like DC, where, where sort of that whole thing started popping up? Oh, approximately eight miles. Eight oh, to that's not miles. that's nothing. I thought it was farther than that. Oh no no no! It's like a hop, skip, and a jump. But we, oh. in fact, when we you could hit you could, like you go down Columbia Pike and you right you hit the Pentagon, boom, go across Fourteenth Street oh. Bridge. That, that was the old way, 14th Street, before you find out about Rock Creek Parkway, 14th Street Bridge, and boom, you're, you're in D.C. Right. But then you go to Georgetown, it's even quicker, <laughs> you know. So, right. Yeah. So then I met Franz, I guess that was, like I said, then about the 10th or 11th grade, because I was like, you know, I played football and everything. About, I think, 11th grade, I got kicked off the football team for smoking marijuana. And uh, that'll do it. Yeah. And messing with the cheerleaders and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that'll do it. And then uh, so that, that actually was my senior year. And I get kicked out of school. And Franz was already like, Pete had already graduated, obviously. And he was like a manager of, of uh, this place called Joe Thousand's Restaurant, where we all were starting to work at. And so we all started like cultivating, like talking about bands and going to see shows and everything together. You know, and uh, then, you know, we sort of, we've, Franz and I just started, you know, because I played guitar and he played guitar. And we started playing together and we just formed, like, you know, doing a lot of cover songs and Pete would always suggest songs to do. Pete had the better, you know, more information about the music. He It was back in the, you know, late 70s when it was no internet. So it was like, he had to like listen up closely. Yeah, you had to. to, get, you had to you really had to. You had to go out and find it. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you had to. Of course, you had the radio pushing their crap, and yeah, yeah. And you start out listening to that, but then you, you hear a little bit of rock and roll from somewhere. Yeah. I mean, some real rock and roll, like the garage stuff, like you know, like Roy Roy, Roy, Roy Loney and the Phantom Movers and bands like that, which are just abstract. Roy, you know, Roy Buchanan and area musicians around D.C. and start to see stuff like that was was what was any of this sort of uh any of this i, I don't i know it wasn't hardcore at the time but was any like you know you know what band comes up and i have them coming on the show pretty soon is uh is the slicky boys like yes. was, was, was any of that stuff yeah ch check this out i got them uh coming on the sh they're coming on oh they're great on in a couple of weeks um uh, Keith and Kim Kane, uh, Marshall Kim Kane, yeah, yeah, Kim Kane, he's great, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mark's coming, coming on, 
Do you say hello uh, to those guys? Tell them about yeah, Marshall and Kim Kane. Yeah. Oh, Marshall Keys. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I thought you. Uh, I thought you meant uh, Mark Moon. I mean the singer. What's it, Moon? Hey, the singer. He's a great guy. The whole band's are fucking just great people. The, the, you yeah, know, but I, see, Pete, Pete, the lead singer, of Scream, because uh -huh. back then you had to be twenty-one usually to get in the yeah. places. But Pete uh, would go to like these places, like the psychedelic and places in Bethesda, right outside of DC. Uh -huh. And he was older, so he was the first one to come back. Because <laughs> at the time, we were listening to, like, Mahavishi Orchestra. And, right. you know, and, you know, it was, like, Little Feet. Those are, like, all, you know, sure. those sure. were all the big bands. You know, the, and the Stones had just played Warner Theater under the names of the Roaches, and everybody was buzzing about that. But then underneath it all was this undercurrent of, like, all this uh, great underground music going on in D.C. And Slicky Boards, of, you know, the nurses and, I can't even remember that. Just all these great. Did you uh, see? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming I'm I was seeing, pretty young during that time, but you know, I couldn't get in the club. But Pete would always come back and tell us about it. At what point did the Babarins come into play? God, somewhere around like you know, late. Uh, for me, is the way my memory served me. I was, I was still like in high school, so it was like late '79. Yeah, and and they were playing. At Madam's Organ mm -hmm. on 18th Street in Northwestern DC. Sure. And at, and they saw, I mean, it was because they had clubs and we couldn't get into, but then they started having this at Madam's Organ, anybody could go to. And they would start, <laughs> you know, they didn't check IDs at the door. Right. It was a free for all. <laughs> it was a total free for all. You pay like three or four bucks getting in the doors, like beer, yeah. you know, underage. Kids drinking the whole whole nine the whole decadent scene, but most of the kids were straight. But you know, we would we weren't we, we were the bad kids yeah. that scene. But we would uh go there and you know, for me, I, I, for camera, it was like, uh, you know, the bad brains, just like, just appeared, <laughs> just came into my world through the whole Madam's Organ thing. It's like every weekend. Yeah. For a while, you could go to Madison, Oregon, and see like you know Youth Brigade, and at the time before Minor Threat and all those bands, you know and, uh, Red Sea and Teen uh, Idols, Teen, Teen Idols, Idols and Nihilistics, right? and bands like yeah. that. It's just I, yeah. I can't even remember. It's a whole it's yeah, yeah. so many bands, and for me, it was just a, you know some suburban kid coming into DC. My dad lived in DC, so I wasn't too intimidated by DC, but but I know I remember Franz and. Oh, everybody was like, oh, we're in D.C. And, and then on top of that, we'd go, you know, we'd be the odd people out because it seemed like most, we'd go with four or five people and it'd probably be like 75, 80 people and it seemed like they all knew each other. You know? sure. Sure. <laughs> it was like a playground and we were like the new kids on the playground. You know? yeah. <laughs> and we are always trying to, you know, be noticed but not be noticed, you know. Yeah. And going these wild, but yeah, and the bad when the bad brains came, I just totally blew my mind away because you know I didn't expect it. You know, Peter, tell you got to see his band's all black punk band called Bad Brains, and, and and at the time I saw it, you know, it's like you know, you got to remember I'm just this kid, and you know, no punk attire, not really punk knowledge, and then you know, HR and Gary and Daryl and Earl come in. I think Daryl at the time had like. Half his hair was bleached blonde. <laughs> Once, you know, I'm like, you know, maybe like 16. Just going, oh my, he's like six foot, you know, six foot 11. Teen. You know, Terrell's all tall and lean. Yeah, yeah. And he's like looking so cool, wearing a suit with, with an old man tie on, leaning up against, you know, just rocking out on the base. And, and you know, Dr. No, and some, I think he was in some like surgical looking gear. You know, and you know, just they just look so cool. They're all wearing shades. And I was just like, oh, I was just in awe, you know, because and it wasn't as blistering fast as it, you know, it was just real mid tempo. Yeah, that 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 sort of uh, stay close to me and yeah, the that, black that, dot deal. Yeah, the whole black dot that's, that's right. That's right. It, it was it wasn't 
it it they, it didn't go triple speed yet. It was it was. Oh yeah, it didn't hit the hyper speed, and they 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 would all and that's you know the first time I saw them, they did paranoid. Oh, oh I remember when I remember when they used to do that. And that yeah. blew my mind because I was a yeah. huge Sabbath. I was like, yeah, Sabbath yeah, yeah. and Zeppelin. I was like the black dude yeah. school, like, you know, because we, I was, I hung out with the hippies and the freaks. They called me a frock, right? Because they, <laughs> they had the jocks and the freaks. So. You're a frock. I, I was never a frock. heard that. That's yeah, that's what they called me because I hung out with both of them because I was well, I was like on the football team, starting football team. But and I started varsity when I was a freshman. Really, they moved me up to junior. I mean, JV, and then they. Moved me to varsity, and but I hung out and smoked weed with all the hippies. So, and we had a park, and we'd throw frisbee. But anyway, I digress. So when I saw these guys, you know, that hurt Sabbath and all this crap, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. for yeah. years. And, you know, then I said, my mom would always be like, turn that shit down, you know, before earphones and shit like that. And, you know, my mom would be working all the time. She'd come home from work, and I'd be blasting Sabbath, or like, or even like, you know, Rosin Mountain Boys, anything. It's like, but anyway, not Rosin, but, but, uh, but I knew that song, you know, but the Bad Brain started and they did it when they even like when they first did it, I heard them do it. They just did it at a blistering pace. At least I thought at the time and it just blew my mind. I just and, uh, you know, and I told and I remember telling people about it and the, and the hippies, you know, the heavy metal kids. And they're like, what? Punk band that did Sabbath? No way. You know, like that. Like, we didn't say no way back there, whatever. Yeah, like, but it was fucking just just blew my mind. How so? How did um? I got a couple of changed my life as I say. They, yeah, <laughs> they they were they they were uh they I don't I don't want to say they changed a lot of lives, but they inspired Bad Brains inspired a lot of people early on. Man, I mean oh, they, they they I I can't think of a band that I mean there's a couple bands that really in really inspired that many people, but the Bad Brains. Uh, early, in those early years, there uh, a lot of people were really inspired by by them. Uh, they, oh, they, they broke a lot of barriers. They broke all yeah, the rules. They, they broke every every yeah. concept, every like yeah. whatever you know the stereotype <laughs> right off the bat. You know? Yeah, athletic sure. Joseph HR would do backflips and he climbed they the wall. A, they they had a great front man back then, man. Oh, dude, that was actually he's, <laughs> he he's, was. He epic. was in those in the in that 80, 80, 81, 82. He oh was, my he was unbelievable. Yeah, nobody could nobody could touch him. I mean, just yeah, yeah. He, he was just I, want out, I want to shout out Ryan Bland from Ake. What's up, Ryan? Hope you well, buddy. Oh yeah, what's up, Ryan? No doubt. Yeah, yeah. And I want to shout out Paris Mayhew from uh from Agros and, and formerly Crow. Oh Man. yes, yes, Paris. Yeah, I know what's, Paris up? Too. what's up, what's up, Paris? Paris. Jeff. Yeah. Bra so, next. Uh, I saw Jeff up there. Yeah, of course. Bad Brains, nine thirty club, nineteen eighty two. That was sort of yeah. uh, that was the uh, that yeah, was the, Daniel, the peak of it, man. Nineteen eighty two. So, so how does how does um, Scream come together? What was sort of like the final pieces that came into place? Wow, Scream! Like I said, Franz and I were just hanging out and playing, doing a lot of covers. You know, Cat, cat Scratch Fever, and <laughs> you know, they. Uh, Stranglehold. You're right. Yeah, you know. And then you know, then Pete was like, "Dude, why don't you guys do some more stuff?" And like, and show to some other bands. And Pete started like singing along here and there because we could never keep up, you know, trying to sing. Nobody would ever sing, and we'd right. get lost in the progressions. Like, mm -hmm. Then Pete would step in and sing. And then you know, it's like uh, we we found this guy Kent Stacks. He's like. Is not our original drummer. A lot of people think he is. We had this other guy named Steve. I can't remember his last name for right now. This German guy named Steve, the first generation from Germany, and uh, Steve Atkins. Yeah, and he and he was a great drummer. Like, and he was the original first drummer. And at the time, we and we still couldn't find a freaking bass player, right? right. So, so it was two guitar players. Play. It was, huh? it was, two it was just me and Franz playing guitar, and, right. and Steve was playing right. drums, and and, it, and Pete would like come home from work, and because we would practice, we'd be playing at Pete's, Pete's where Pete lived at with his roommates, and his roommates would always be complaining. So, so then Pete sort of eventually 
stepped up for us. It was like, you know, because it, it was a good place for us to go because, you know, keep us out of trouble, this, that, the other. Of course, we were getting stoned and everything, but we didn't, mm-hmm. you know, we, we weren't out on the streets getting in trouble. So we were playing the instrument. With, and he stepped up and he pretty much stepped in and started singing, you know, giving us more direction because we were like boss. And, and then he said, well, man, why don't, why don't we just start a band? And he was like, and we started that, we started playing. I I acquired, I acquired a bass, but a friend of mine stole a bass from our jazz group of Jeb Stewart, our high school. He broke it and stole it. Is that right? Is that right? Jeb Stewart High School? We went to this school called Jeb Stewart. It's a total like rebel confederate. Wow. That's yeah, it's like, been changed. The, the, the name has been changed. That's the, that's the Formerly real. Jeb Stewart. It's now called Justice. You would think so, man. Uh, they were, that's not. They're talking oh, man, but about, Virginia's they're always the last. Yo, they're talking about tearing down the Columbus, uh, Christopher Columbus statue. You better believe there ain't no more Jeb Stewart High School. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, dude, but still, but still, on Facebook, we they have, like, the Jeb Stewart High School, like, whatever page. I happen to be on that page, and they still, like, go, oh, you never change history. And it's like, dude, it was always fucked up. You know? Yeah, right. It's, like, it's, it's not that you're trying to change history. You just want to. Yeah. What, what name a school after a fucking tyrant? You know? Yeah, it's silly. silly. Or silly. warmonger or anything like that. That's right. That's right. But you know. Yeah, what, yeah. What, so, but, but so basically, we're doing that, and then front, then, then you know, so acquired this bass from the jazz club. My friend, like, I didn't know it. He didn't do it for you. He, he he came and he, he sold me this bass for like fifty bucks, like Homeboy Shopping Network. It was a jazz, a Fender jazz. <laughs> I go for the strap. I got a Fender Jazz, right? And I go like, dang. And everybody starts to go, this is a great freaking bass. And I go, I didn't know. Right. And then, you know, I asked her, where did you get this bass from? He said, oh, I got it from, well, from school. You know what I mean? So check it out. So I, so I started playing bass, just like guitar. And, you know, Pete stepped up, started singing. Steve was still playing drums. And, and we just started out in Berkeley and doing all these garage covers of, you know, like the animals. We do a lot of animals. Sure. You know, we got to get out of this place. We got to get out of this place. Yeah, you know, stuff like that. That was our, like, you know, because yeah. we were trying to play in the bars around Virginia because we lived in Virginia. Right. And then, you know, then we heard about this underground scene in D.C. And then, and, you know, and it, and it, so we started going there and, and Steve, that, that was us. It was Pete, me, Fran, Steve the first. Right. And I'm going to ask me, Kent was going there too. He had started, you know, Kent, I knew Kent, I've known Kent since we were in second grade. Wow. But it, it, and now it's, and we always listen, he always listened to, you know, UFO and stuff. All my friends always enlightened me to other like rock and roll and stuff. I was into the old soul and blue stuff and the, the UFO and metal and stuff like that from Kent. And, but I digress. We, so then, you know, Steve didn't like, you know, we go to punk shows. He wasn't into the punk show. He was just like, I'm not into this. You know, we started doing originals. He's like, I don't want to do any punk stuff anymore. I don't want to do any, because we're already playing too fast at all these. He wanted to do like UFO. Let's do UFOs. Like, no, dude, let's do Warrior Loney and the Phantom Movies. Let's do the animals. And, you know, and he was like, no, dude, you know, he wanted to do leads and all this stuff and, and drum solos. And he wanted to do some jazzy stuff. And we're like, nah. It's above our, you know, we're just into this new energy that we just found. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so then, so he backed out and then he was like, and he kept like trying to pull a power trip. So we, I was like, dude, I knew Kent and Franz knew Kent too because we had jammed with Kent a few times. I was like, oh, well, we asked Kent Kent's into the same thing. Like, yeah. Talk to Kent and the rest of his history. Kent. Well, you know, of course, it's always important to get like minded people on board, right? And it's just like, you're better off going with a friend who's like-minded than somebody that you yeah. know is technically proficient. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean can't, can't blew, I mean, that's another thing. Can't can't blew him away. It was just a can't. I, I can't remember what was going. Kent was going through some. I can't remember if he was like. It wasn't. He was in reform school or anything like that. But he was like going. <laughs> his school was like. I think he had been kicked out of the schools in our area. And he had to go to school in another area. So we were sort of like in and out of communication. Can't remember exactly how it went. But, uh, yeah, but when we did get in contact, we almost start, immediately started practicing. Because we were practicing at Steve's house. Because we were practicing at Pete's house. And then his roommates got tired of us practicing over there. So then we started practicing over at Steve's house. And his mom 
who didn't speak English, or very broken English, only spoke German. And she didn't like me too much. She'd be like, Kiefer. She kept calling me black and shit. <laughs> sure. But I didn't so then we ended up practicing over at front, I mean, over at Kent's house. And you know, his parents were like moved us downstairs. But you know, that's where we really started to thrive and write all the stuff. So you we guys were- get rolling and you guys get rolling. The first the first interesting, the first flyer I have in uh in my archive is from uh, September 18th, 1982, a show in Baltimore. It's a crazy bill. It's MDC, Scream, Minor Threat, The Bollocks, SSD Control, and Led Zeppelin. (laughs) And (laughs) And a place... I love when people used to do that, like yeah. fucking, and fucking, you know, the Rolling Stones. Yeah, me and Rolling Stones. Yeah, at, at Terminal fourteen oh six. I do not know this particular venue, but this is the earliest um, flyer I have. So I guess you know right away you guys were getting you guys were getting getting in the vehicle and going to play shows a little bit out of town, right? Oh yeah, I mean, well, we started we started like in basement shows at our own. Like having our own shows, playing parties, cake parties, and things like that. And really, you know, that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing a lot of coverage, just basically in Virginia. But then through, you know, after Madam's Oregon, uh, let's see, they were doing a lot of shows at uh, the Bayou, and the Bad Brains were playing, did a great show. And I can't remember, it might have been even the Ramones or somebody. And I, I, you know, and we had been taping with, recorded some stuff and I took our, our tape to HR, Joseph, and I handed it to him. We we're sitting in the van listening to it like after the set. And they're like, yeah, so uh, so they, they said, oh, dude, we're going to start doing shows. So they started, doing, we got to do the show at the Wilson Center, I think, the Bad Brains and a few other shows. I think then Olive Tree had just started, so they, they started to, to give us some shows here and there. So we, yeah, we started playing out almost immediately. After we got, after we, you know, we played it. I think we played the what Woodlawn, which is in Arlington. What, what, what's that? Wood, wood, the Woodlawn High School? Woodlawn, yeah, the Woodlawn. I think it's the intermediate. I think it's high school intermediate, something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that for, uh, right. for, for, for like, you know, for sort of wayward kids, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, like an alternative yeah. school. And so they would always have shows there. We ended up playing with. Here's our, we ended up playing with like, I think it was DOA and Jello Biafra was singing. Wow. And uh, I think it was uh, and the Necros, the DC Necros. Oh, there was a DC Necros, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a great friend of ours, John Moline. And uh, okay, so DC Necros, and it was uh, Youth Brigade or either Teen Idols. And I think it was SOA and and one other, I can't, Red Sea maybe. Uh-huh. And uh, we Red played- C, Red Sea, Red Sea was, was uh, Tony's band, right? Yeah, Tony Young, it was Tony yeah. Young, Eric, uh, yeah. I think Thomas, yeah. which is Onam on drums. Yeah, I remember, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Or guitar was it, I can't remember. Yeah, I think he was on drums at the time. Yeah, and, and so it was like that, that show. And when we played that show, I might have the band wrong, but it was like, but when we played that show, like when we played, everybody pretty much left. It was like, you know what I mean? It's like, well, the Nec- even when the Necros played, because they were f- from Virginia also. Right. The other bands were from DC. And DOA, of course, was the headlining band. Yeah, yeah. With Jello singing. And Joey Shithead was there. They were all there. So, so, uh, so we, so I think it was like Necros played. And like it was hardly, and the people were there as we were sitting up and we started to play the and left. And then, and then they're like, who's next? And then we got up and played and everybody was there. And then as soon as the one note, boom, everybody, just about everybody and stuff. We had a couple of friends and the Necros, they stuck around. And Jell will be offering the DOA and those guys. But then, then the other bands played and everybody went crazy. But then long story short, I sort of made, we sort of started to meet everybody. Right. And, uh, and afterwards Jell-O came up and said, uh, you know, Say, don't worry, they'll give it to you. They gotta give it to you because you like you're gonna blow them away as far as because we're doing like a whole bunch, we're doing sort of stuff almost like the dead Kennedys. 
Right. Because we're doing, we're just starting our original stuff, which is nothing like our first album. It was more like the post punk, you know, had a lot of real beachy sound, really, mm -hmm. you know, reverb. A lot of, we, Fr Franz was playing through a Fender Twin reverb <laughs> <laughs> before they were, we didn't have distortion pedals or anything. So it was nice. Volume nice. distortion, you know. So anyway, and one of those six, it was a super six twin reverb, actually, is what he was playing through. I like um, I like this comment here that uh, uh, Daniel Nice. Am I pronouncing it right, Daniel? Terminal Forty Six nice. was in a well, Nice was an apartment owned by a guy named Jules. Yeah, it was right across. Who, yeah, who regularly had shows there. Those are the days. Jules is loft. You, Jules you can, would have you can a place put on shows in your loft. <laughs> yeah, Jules is loft. It was great, and and that show was awesome. I think SSD control. I'm not sure if SSD played. Here's um. Here's another one. This is up in New York. This is like literally a couple months later in 82. Uh, Heart Attack, which is our friend Jesse Mallon's band. Yeah, yeah. From DC I remember that. At, at the old Peppermint Lounge. Yeah, and I remember yeah. that show vividly. That's when I first met Jesse. It was a great show. Yeah. It was, it was like, I think it was also because like usually more people were at, I think we had played, like I said, we had played CBGBs at Either just before that or right after that a few times. Yeah. Uh, with Bad Brains are taking us up there. They're also using our equipment. I think their equipment has just gotten stolen or something crazy like that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, but I remember that show at Peppermint Lounge. There wasn't a lot of people there. And the Heart Attack was fucking amazing. Yeah, they, they were great. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned the first, uh, the first album, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, th this, you know, I, I really didn't know until I was doing homework. I mean, of course, I know the record, but this was the first band on Discord Records to release like a full a full length record. You are correct. I, I did not know that tidbit. Yeah. Um, could you give us some perspective on this release? Maybe any recollections of recording it and putting it out? Oh, man. Yeah. I remember just record being just in the studio, like hard at work, and Don and Tara and Ian, you know, just just in this closed, nice suburban neighborhood, mm -hmm. trying to dis discover our sound. And like, luckily, we had you know, we had Don and Tara there, and you know, Ian, of course, Andy McKay and Mackay. Sorry. He gets pissed when I say his name wrong. And uh and I remember it being very intimidating because it's the first we had recorded before, but we'd always been in the same room pretty right. much at the same time. And this is the first time they're like starting to <laughs> track and stuff like that. Where, 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 where the where the where the um the the musicians and the instruments were were isolated, so to speak. Correct, you're correct, and it was like, and me, I'm I'm a live guy. I'm like, it's a totally yeah. different environment. But luckily, because I was freaking out on everything. It's like, <laughs> luckily, you know, luckily you had the wit of uh, in comedy relief of Don and, and yeah. Ian, because we were like, in you know, much like you guys were talking about earlier, I was like so full of anxiety and recording. You know, this is a big moment. You know. Because, like, unbeknownst to most people who say, like, you know, I got, I didn't get into, you know, punk rock for money or anything like that. Bullshit. I wanted to get out of get out. And it's always been about, it's always been about making, you know, great music and being being rewarded for it. So. And and Ian, Ian. Uh, so we were really, he, like, uptight. And is, Ian, is, like, is it fair to say it, it, he produced it? Uh, what, what would you call a producer? He, he basically in hardcore back then the producer was the guy that kind of like booked the studio at time got you in the studio and was behind the glass telling yeah, you to finance the air yeah his foot yeah exactly yeah 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 engineer was dying yeah, exactly see see a lot of people think and this was and excuse me this was in Don's place when it was in his house right at his house exactly in his yeah, basement yeah, yeah. it was it was it was I mean we're literally beside his like I mean I think the guitar was set up in his bathroom, the isolation of the guitar, and my bass cabinet was in his laundry room. <laughs> like, the, the, like where the linen closet, where the linen were. 
for the sure. living of us. Yeah. And, and then the, the drums were out in the, the living room, <laughs> the play area. You know, and he had all these dolls because he had, you know, he's got like, I think he's got like two girls who are all adults now, but he had, you know, they're totally like spoiled ch- little, little ladies, you know what I mean? They had yeah. toys everywhere and dolls and doll houses and, you know what I mean? Stuffed animals every all around us. So it, carpeting everywhere. So, I mean, the sound was somewhat compressed. And we were used to like playing in basements, you know what I mean? Sure. Sure. So it was all a new experience and different and and this was, very, this very intense because we did like a hell of a lot of recording. We did a hell of a lot of songs. There's a lot of stuff that didn't even make it on. I think it's like four songs that didn't even make it on there, four or five songs. I mean, this was this was uh, 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 I don't want to say it was a big deal at the time, but like it was uh, it was a lot to digest. It was a twelve inch. You know, yeah. it was, there was a lot on it. Well, are, you, big club, man. Yeah. Uh, are you, are you, um, in retrospect, are, they, uh, are you, are you happy with it? Has it stood the test of time? Dude, honestly, I mean, still to this day, I, you know, I love the songs. I love the, the effort and everything that we came with that warning, you know, all, all those great yeah. songs. Uh, st- we still play them, but we play them. I'm still, yeah, you know, I don't like the way it sounds, <laughs> you know. I Me and Ian, like I've talked before, I, I just wish it had more of a professional sound, more of a balanced sound. And I'm, I'm proud of it, though, but I just wish. Like, yeah. it's I, I've made a lot of mistakes. I was playing, it's too fast here. It's, you know, you can't hear this there, you know. Hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yeah, um, I mean, but also, you know, I didn't know, you know, you didn't know in a controlled environment. He didn't know how to get those sounds it was early in my career or whatever you want to call it in my experience yeah. in life. Yep. Here's a, here's a, uh, just, just touching on this. I, I had this one in the archive, you know, you guys coming back up to New York and playing great Gildersleeves. Uh, this was, this was, uh, oh, you froze. Oh, this yeah. is my back. Um, this is great. Yeah, you're back. You're moving now. Yeah. This is a uh, Gil- great Gildersleeves in New York city. Uh, did you guys uh, enjoy coming up to New York, playing these New York shows? Always loved coming up to New York. We're always, t- I mean, I remember the days, of, you know, what is it, A171 and yeah, yeah. Gary Williams and you know, recording there, the war tapes and uh, yep. just great, up, uh, just the energy. I remember fucking playing, I can't even remember, was it A- A7 on the corner right there? Yeah. St. Mark's or whatever. Yep. At like two thirty in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, getting off stage, maybe four o'clock, total sweat. You know, just this is a whole different vibe. Yeah, yeah. Was, I, I've never, I've never have a bad thing to say about New York City. Other, you know, yeah. other than uh, they st- we got ripped off a couple of times and we left equipment in the van, which is stupid. <laughs> Especially, it's, you know, back 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 then, down in that area where A seven and CBs was. Yeah, you, you you'd uh, like walk away from your car for five minutes, and then your your shit was. Oh, forget man. about it. yeah. Dude. Check yeah. check it out. We we were done, like, and it's weird too because we were playing. I can't remember we were playing with. They're like, oh no, we just go ahead and use our drums. And they're like, and I think Kent didn't want to bring out his drums or something. And we had, uh, and he had just gotten a pair of some drums stolen at the Wilson Center in fucking D.C. So Harley Harley was there. Harley Flanagan was there with his dog. He had this nice pit bull. I forget the pit bull's name. But he put we put the pit bull in the van because we left the drums at, it was in front of CB's. We left and we came back and somebody had like tried to break in the van and get the drums, but the dog is fucking right. it's like a pool of little blood. I'm, and the I'm, dog was hanging outside the van. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skipping, I'm skipping around a little bit. Oh, but yeah. um I have this show that, that we played together. Um, this is, this is a, a, this is a classic. Um, we came down, this is, oh God, I remember this was July 4th weekend. And when I was, when I was in Antidote, we came down your way and we did rock against Reagan on the lawn of the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. And, uh, there, it was a wild fucking show. Cause I remember, it sort of yeah, I have another flyer. Someone mentioned it. Well, who else played with on that? On that, it was 
it was trying, what year was it what year was it? 85 it was a uh, stetisonic mcs unclassified half-life screen well, yeah. ant antidote beef eater at the at the lawn and the lincoln memorial yeah and i think this and i remember the day before yeah so yeah yeah the day before yeah. i remember that one yeah and then it ended with some sort of a brawl some skinhead brawl some crazy shit broke out and like you know right in front of the stage and like yeah that that was a wild show that was a wild yeah. show <laughs> wow I, I think see we i think we were supposed to play that show uh -huh. and that's when the show when pete got busted Ooh. Pete got busted, then I got, we both got busted, actually. Do you remember that? I, I think, did we play? Did Scream end up playing? I don't remember. I know that when we play, I remember that when we played, there was some crazy violence, some skin, some skinheads came and, and were like busting heads. Well, those and, are all of my boys. Yeah, it, the, the whole, the whole scrum came right onto the stage and we were playing when it happened and we like waited until literally People and then we just stopped playing and jumped off the back of the stage. It was yeah. a wild show. Yeah, yeah. My boy, wild, yeah, I remember, but... people said that show ended up like pretty wild. I, we were in jail. We didn't get out till way late. Yo, DC. You know, we almost ended up in jail too on that trip because we we the cops pulled us over, and I, I'll never forget. After that, I was like, I'm never going back to DC. Fuck DC because the cops in DC want to know. What, like, why are you here? What are you doing here? Oh, yeah, that was during the era of Reagan. So you had yeah. you know, Rock yeah. against Reagan, Rock against yeah. racism. Yeah, they so, just said they want to know what you're doing in D.C. Yeah, and like, oh you're, here, oh, you're here to play punk rock music? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, oh, dude, it was it was intense. And, and that's why, I mean, even like our skinheads, we had like a, our skinheads, we had to get, you know, the sharp skins. Um, but not yeah, they yeah. weren't sharp skins at the time, yeah. but they were like the non-racist skins, and the uh, ones that were just bullheaded. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And it, then he had the, like the street skins. It was like they were just like you know, it, it, we just hung out in pubs and bars and shit. And, sure. But but we ruled that town and like especially like the yippies who, who put on that show. Yeah, that was th th these rock against the rock against racism and, and rock against Reagan. It was really yippie. It was really the yippies that were behind. Yeah, they, and they were the same people that make the Anakin's cookbook. You know, these. these yeah, people. right. That's right. And they're the same people that do the pop parade too. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. it was mainly it was about it started off being against like, for pot. You know, it's for normal. Yeah. You know. You know, and it, it became racing it, you know, because I knew all those guys from hanging out. Because, like I said, my dad is from D.C., so I would spend half the time in D.C. I met all those guys from when we used to go to Madam's Oregon. Yeah. And so I would see them later when I go see my dad. And I met Russell, which is this guy named Charlie Davis. And, you know, like, oh, that's how I met H.R. He doesn't even probably remember when he was hunting Rod, but that's what I met with before the dreads and all that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was sure. still like, you know, just wild and 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 and, and he uh <laughs> that's what I mean. And he and we would like that's how I met all the skinheads too. And, and to see the Yippie organization that you know they 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 have tentacles involved in so many things. You'd be surprised, and they would yeah, put on the greatest, just, yeah, the greatest outdoor. York, they yeah. were the first people I remember putting on like outdoor events. Yeah, you know when you had. For I sure. mean, because remember we were still everything was still really meager. Sound systems were still, you know, we, I still had no knowledge of sound and, and ambience and things like that. We were just plugging in and playing. So it was absolutely. Cool. Hey, let me take uh, let me take a sponsor break here. Right on. Uh, for, for a couple of minutes, you, you you got a couple of minutes here. We're going to come back. We're going to do a little women of the pit uh, uh, segment for a bit, and we'll be back. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. All right, see you. All right, that's right. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Still at it. Can you imagine? Want to mention? I want to mention before we before we kind of go to our thing. Um, upcoming shows. Got a bunch of upcoming shows. Some really good ones. Uh, a week from today, filmmaker Danny Garcia will be on the show. Um, a couple days after that, leading up to episode 250, episode 249, Louis Beetle from Carnivore, which was a uh, guy I was chasing around for a long time. And then, of course, the landmark 250th episode 
Lars from Rancid. Sunday, March 26, uh, Abaddon from Venom. Uh, Slicky Boys, which we talked about earlier. Slicky Boys on uh, March 29th and uh, rescheduled. Phil Demmel from Violence and Machine Head. Now we're going to announce a couple of shows. Ready? If you're ready, I'm ready. Actually, no, this one was announced already. Uh, Wednesday, April 19th, Senor Pistachio from H2O. But here you go. By popular demand, Kira from Black Flag, Dose, Twisted Roots, uh, her solo stuff. And uh, she's a sound editor. Uh, she worked on uh, Mad Max, um, what is it, uh, Fury Road. Uh, they won an Oscar for that. But uh, this is a, a guest that we've uh, wanted on the show for a long time, Kira, uh, formerly of Black Flag. Uh, this is going to be a great one. And then uh, soon after that, uh, another one. How about Theo from the Lunachicks? There you go. You got Theo from the Lunachicks coming on Sunday, May 7th. So there's a lot going on, you know, with, with this show. So, yeah, man. yeah, we got Kira happening. We got Theo happening. Yep. We're still at it. <laughs> we ain't going nowhere. Yeah. So, so that said, uh, yeah, how about that, huh? That's right, Lori Dawn. It's going down. That's right. Yep. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. That said, let's hear from our sponsor here a little bit, and we'll come back. We'll do a little Women of the Pit. Uh, we'll talk to Skeeter some more. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey, guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do, and we are happy to see you guys. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, the pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. Star Wars. We are New York hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it off. What's happening? We're back. This is the one, the only New York Hardcore Chronicles live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, ATF and Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Upstate Records. I want to talk to you about some live shows that are going on, starting with uh, this Sunday. We mentioned it before. Let's, let's mention it again. This Sunday at the Bowery Electric, free all ages. If it's free, it's for me. Two-man advantage, first New York show in five years. Enziguri, non-residents, fuck it, I quit. And Iconicide with DJ Spike Polite. 
After that, at Generation Records, we have the Paris Mayhew Rise of the Agros listening and signing event. Our old friend Paris Mayhew. Uh, Q and A. Uh, I'll be hosting a Q and A. Come on down. Uh, the, the the Agros debut record is fantastic. Paris will be there signing copies of said item. Uh, Women of the Pit um, uh, event, which we're going to speak about. We're going to bring them on in a couple minutes. Uh, we'll save that for them. Uh, Sunday, April 2nd, Channel 3 celebrating the release of Channel 3 40th anniversary box set. Of course, Incendiary Device. It's going to jump off tonight. War Orphan featuring ex sick of it all Richie Sip, Slashers, and Regicide. Uh, Sunday, April 30th, Go is coming to town. First New York City show in 12 years with Crazy Eddie, Down Low, Crippled Erm, and Chum Huffer. Rampage Fest 5 Sunday, May 21st. Seven bands, two stages, upstairs, downstairs, all ages. Free. Matinee on the Bowery. Reaching Out, Cropsy, Extinguish the Code, Pink Mist, Sewage, Raid, and Disguise. Listen, what do you want me to do? Your fucking ass to this show. What do you want me to tell you? What do, you mean, what do I got to do? Set up in your living room? This is it. Come on. Rampage Fest 5. There you go. Saturday, May 27th, in our beloved Tompkins Square Park. It is Leeway, Rebelmatic, Butterbrain, Winterwolf, and Scott Helen. Guitar me of one in our beloved Tompkins Square Park. And then it is my and Steve Zing from uh, Sam Hain and Danzig. Uh, our, it's our birthday bash, and you're invited. Uh, Morning Noise are playing their first New York City show in 35 years. He, uh, Steve's dusting off his old band. I'm dusting off the High and the Mighty. We're going to do a High and the Mighty set. Road Warrior, Time is Right, Ready to Fight, all that shit. Uh, One Life All In with Don Foos. The Amazing Concrete Ties and Chemical X. That is at the Bowery Electric on Sunday, June 25th. So get your ass down there. Uh, support the show. Please support the show. Um, there's the Patreon page or make, make, a, make a donation on PayPal. Support the show that supports you, right? Uh, I want to shout out Stefan Sonic, uh, Jeff Steiner, Brendan Murray, and, and Marla uh, Standing Owl, who are our recent... Patrons, thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, what else? What's going on? Uh, yes, Leeway and Rebel Matter. Yes, lots going on. Um, what else do I need to mention? Uh, blah, 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 blah. You know what? I mentioned a lot. Join Patreon. What can I tell you? You know? Get up, get down. That said, let, let's, let's put the proper, proper little logo up there. And let's bring our friends, Lori Dawn, uh, Gina, and Hello. Kim from Upstate Records. Hey. Hey. Hey, <laughs> hey there you are. It's a You're triple number threat. again. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, we'll kind of use this as, as a cool kind of reference. Uh, we have this event coming. We have this event coming up at Generation Records, uh, the release event and flora and maafa are playing so we're excited oh, about yeah. that saturday yeah. march 25th uh tell us Lori, uh, what's happening with the release what's going on okay well we are on target the release is um the release for the cd is march 24th uh the pre-orders are going really well if people want to get the pre-order it's um up on oh. etsy um, you can get the physical copy there. You can also get a physical copy at Bandcamp or the digital download. Hold on a second. Stop it. <laughs> March 24th on, is also Kim's birthday. The cat. This, oh. this is happening. Hold on. <laughs> so I want to say shout out, Flora. I see you in the comments, sis. I see yep. you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We're yeah. super excited, honored that she is part of our compilation. Her and her band, Ma'afa, are part of our compilation and are so excited that she's going to be performing live at our at our listening party at our show. So endless gratitude to you, Flora. We love you. And this is gonna be this is gonna be a fun event. Uh, uh, downstairs at Generation Records, it's a it's a tight space. 
uh, it, it's always fun. And, and, we, and we've done a bunch of events there, and they're always fun. Of course, everybody's welcome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, people are asking how much are the tickets. It's free. It's a free show. So yeah, come on down. It's free, you bum. Get your ass down there. <laughs> well, you know? We <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I, I also need to mention Say it a little nicer. Yeah. <laughs> you can also get the uh, pre-order on uh, Upstate Records. So. Yep. And everything yeah, on our website yeah. is going 100% back to the Women of the Pit for the, um, what's the fun? Global <laughs> Fund for Women. The Global, Global Fund, fund for, for Women. women. <laughs> it all swear. starts to blend together after a while, right? You say yeah. it enough times. <laughs> Kim has been instrumental in um, pretty much just holding our hands throughout this whole entire process. We could not have done it without her and Mario from Upstate. So yeah. gratitude. Shout out to you too. Oh, as always. Well, thank you very much. You guys have been awesome to work with too. I've been super excited on this project. I can't wait till the second one. We'll start getting yeah. real. <laughs> <laughs> too. We have some volume two names in the mix already. So exactly. Let's just enjoy volume one though. <laughs> yeah. Are we, we going to do, are we going to do like a, a cake or, or, or cupcakes at, at this thing? Oh, that's a good no, question. Let's plan something fun. <laughs> You that know, can be your job, Joe. <laughs> yeah, right, I'll, I'll do some, I'll do some case for this one. You yeah, ask about it, it becomes your job. <laughs> you know what? No, we'll, we'll 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 ask Mark to get a cake from those people that he got a Brooks cake from. The oh people that my make gosh. those incredible those they make the most incredible cakes. Yeah. Did anyone ever eat that cake, or is it still in the freezer? I, bet I don't know. But, no, I don't know because the cake was so big. Wasn't there a cake no one, from the event before it? Like everyone ate yes. that cake. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and so I think no one Brooke even touched took, Brooke's um, cake. Yeah, yeah, Brooke took her cake home. So. Oh, did she? Yeah, she yeah. got to take hers home. So. Hey, uh, Kim oh, Harris Mayu says, that. thanks for all the help with the Agros album. Oh, program. anytime, Paris. Definitely yeah. not going to work on it with you. It's awesome. Yeah. Just awesome. Yeah. That's that's uh, Kim. What else is going on? Uh, isn't there? Isn't the Fury of Five release out there now? Nope, it comes out this Friday. Fury of Five Half Past Revenge will be dropping this Friday, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, it's a good. We one. have a special announcement too. We're doing vinyl and windbreakers, so pre-orders go live for that on Friday as well. You do it. Uh, the the Fury of Five windbreaker. Yeah. Fury Five is like a merch band. Like they had great <laughs> merch back in the day. You know. So, absolutely, That's great. yeah. See, everybody hey, wants Fred, cupcakes, cupcakes. I want all the cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, we'll have to see about cupcakes. And you know what? And not those fight. Melissa, not those bullshit Melissa's cupcakes, right? The, they're like, like a bite. It's like a bite no, of a cupcake. What a even Melissa's is that? <laughs> there's a Melissa's cupcake in my neighborhood, and they're like this. I'm like, yeah. And then yeah. I went in there once. So I was like, how much are those? I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah, it was like four dollars a bite. Yeah. Yeah, a bite. <laughs> <laughs> Not worth it. No. But anyway, it just, just to remind you, everybody, the event is on Saturday, March 25th at Generation yes. Records. Mm -hmm. Maafa will be playing. Uh, we will yeah. all be there. Everybody yes. is welcome. Yes, and if you yeah. pre-ordered without shipping, you can pick it up there as well. So I don't know if that was mentioned. Oh, is that right? Oh, my cat was ripping up my couch. Um, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. If you pre if you pre-ordered without shipping, you can without pick up there? Without shipping, yeah. We did like a local pickup, so that's the place to pick it up at. Oh, okay. You guys yep. are like Amazon. Like you, get, like, you, get <laughs> from the, you can pick it up from the Amazon locker. You know? Exactly. We, we give all the options. We got it all sorted. <laughs> All right, good. So, well, thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, looking forward to seeing you guys soon. I know I'll, I'll probably see a couple. Of, Gina, I'll probably see you on Sunday down at the Bowery Electric, right? Uh, this Sunday, you might not see me over there. This Sunday, I can't make it out. I'm sorry, okay. too. <laughs> but I will see you soon. Okay. For sure. I'll, I'll see you later, Lori. See you, Gina. Bye-bye, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. See you later. There you have it, Women of the Pit. That said, let's bring today's guest back on the show, Mr. Skeeter Ena Thompson. Hey, bro. Hey. All right. And we're back. Um, you know what I wanted to ask you about? Um, I, I know we're going to, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're, po we're poking around a little bit, but um, the, 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 this, this record, this record, was actually uh, produced 
by Dr. No from the Bad Brains, right? What, this side up? Yeah. 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 Is that this side up? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Doc was there for that. Gary was there for that. Uh, what was that? I think we did that in Maryland somewhere. We did that in another studio. He also mm -hmm. played piano on Still Screaming on the reggae team. Here's here's the back here's the back cover with with uh, with some of the info. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Now yeah. now now it, it, the the second part of the record or, or, or part B. You guys add another guitar player uh, to the mix, right? Yeah, Harley. Robert Davidson. Robert Lee. Robert Robert Lee Davidson. Robert what Lee was, Davidson. What was the what was the sort of train of thought as to let's let's bring another guy on board? Uh we're definitely we're just. What's up, Bob Riley? We were just, uh, you know, expanding the sound more. Uh, we all, like I said, we started out playing with two guitars, and we always wanted to get that full sound. And there's Franz. What's up, brother? What's up, Franz? What's up, baby? Yeah. And uh, and so in front and and Harley, well, we call him Harley. Mm -hmm. Goes with the names, really Arley, for Arley or Robert Lee. But uh, so we added him. He was he was actually. In the family, in the mix, he was in another band called Tyrant. Ah, okay. It was a metal band, and he was dating Pete and Franz's sister, Sabrina. Oh, I, I never, I never got when, when when Franz was on the show. He never mentioned that. Yeah, see, <laughs> see I'll give you all the dirt. And it was right. like, you know, it was just, it was. He was like, you know, Tyrant was a whole different kind of like you know metal band, and we were just sounds, looking. Sounds very but, metal. Sounds very metal. Oh yeah, it, 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 like, it was a, during the time of like, uh, what's that band? I'm, I'm having a brain fart now. Oh mm -hmm. uh, God, breaking the law, breaking the Judas law. Judas Priest. Judas Priest, yeah. So Tyrant, like, they, their, their claim to fame was like they would play these little. They had their whole lights in PA, but Harley actually brought a Harley Davidson into a little club <laughs> 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 and started up. But I digress. Yeah, Harley. He joined the band and it just filled up the sound. You know, we're already moving. Like I said, I've always loved metal and Franz's. And when we were starting to branch out as far as writing music and stuff, you know, because the first record was pretty much a lot of collabos and nobody like, but we're like sort of, you know, matured, so to speak, and mm -hmm. doing uh, this side up where it started to. To get more, we wanted more of a like, like heavier sound, and wanted to get more in the leads and sure. more dynamics well, and well, stuff. I think I think part of it. Correct me if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, just what was going on, sort of out there. Uh, it, it's like Black Flag got another guitar player, SSD Control got a second guitar player. Yeah. It was sort of in the air there. Everybody was kind of getting minor, minor threat, threat, minor threat, Brian minor moved threat got Brian another guitar. And they brought in Steve. And like it seemed like it was the, the evolution was the of yeah. 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 And I mean I, I mean it, it was just to fill up the sound and just and people I think people were just like I said were maturing. And yeah. and so and Harley just fit in really naturally, you know. It was total and I think we also You'd say you're right. SSD. Everybody. I think even Discharge had yeah. like changed a little bit. I think, oh yeah. What's the name? Kyle. Where we started singing higher or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they really, they really went woo. Yeah, they went, really went metal. And we and I always thought so we were we, like. So did huh? Antidote. So did Antidote. So, did, yeah, I mean, we it was did just, the Return to Burn record. It was like very different. Yeah, and it's just everybody matured. So that's and Harley just stuck around for I think two albums and. Yeah, great, great to work with him. And he, he also uh, the record after that was uh, no more censorship, right? And no, no, no. <laughs> then after that was banging the drum. Ah, right. I'm sorry, I skipped one. No yeah, more I censorship guess. was with, and banging the drum was with Kent still. Right. Still Got it. Kent. And we did. I think that was done. Part That's of right. that was recorded in, in an inner ear, and yep. part of it was recorded in, and. Uh, Southern Lord, Southern Studios in uh in England. That's where Crass and all those guys were. 
Sure. Before, we were sort of split that one, I believe, if my memory serves. Sorry. When you were asking before, like, what, what, like, that album, like, and as the albums progressed, I started to like them more and more. The first, I was really, like, the first album, like, Still Screaming, I was a little, like, after I, you know, I started to notice, oh, I messed up on this and played too fast. We were playing way too fast and, mm-hmm. you know, you can't hear any distinction and stuff like that. To like, this, this side up was much more distinct. You know what I mean? Got it. And then, and then, and then, this, I mean, and banging the drum was even more like the song arrangements and everything were, you know, Franz had really opened up the door and, and of songwriting. And then Pete was writing songs and we became tr- like some of the Eagles fighting them, you know, we, all these alpha males trying to get their point across. I'm Glenn Fry. No, I'm Glenn Fry. <laughs> no. I'm Don Henley, God damn it. No. That, that took some great though. I mean, Scream, we really, I mean, we really had a, a pyramid sort of like it was I had two two brothers in the band, you know. So yeah, they sure. have their own little like like war going on. But they got along pretty like well. They they really, you know. Uh Je- Jeff Kaplan from Two Man Advantage says banging the drum is the dark horse in the Scream catalog. Yeah. See, Excellent. I think bang, banging the drum, I really did like the whole like intro, even just like we were just trying to we're trying to push the envelope, as they say, and sure, sure, and just get deep in our like become vulnerable and all that stuff. And it's, you know, we tried slower songs, ballads, and yep. Um, around this time, soon after, uh, Dave joins the band. Did did he? Is that true? The story he lied he lied about his age to and and all that to to get in. Well, yeah. Well, well it was it wasn't. So much that he lied about it. I just said, don't don't throw it out there, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like with uh, with Pete and Franz because we we when Kent when we couldn't uh, take Kent on tour and everything, he knew, he realized we couldn't tour, and uh, he had other responsibilities, and uh, you know uh, we, we tried out quite a few drummers, and they were all great drummers. But they sort of ch- changed the dynamic of the sound. I think uh-huh. we even recorded with you know this one friend of mine named John Pappas. We mm-hmm. did this song called "If the Smile Fits," and we some hidden somewhere. But we, but uh, it just sort of changes the, the sound. But Dave, uh, when we met Dave. I can't remember how who met him first or whatever. I'm sure everybody claims it. <laughs> first, I can't. Really, that I'm really the one. Matter. I'm the one who saw him, and I saw real talent in that guy. Right. Oh, oh. the great thing was, is like the crazy thing is that like he was just he, he knew a lot of the drummers we tried out were like great drummers. Uh, like uh, I think Pete Moffat, we tried him out. He's a great drummer. Played with GIs and sure. Sure. This guy, John Pappas, like I said before, he's a jazz drummer, born again Christian now, my Christian brother. Right. You know, I'm a Jew. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he, he, but when Dave came along, he already knew the songs. You know, a lot of the guys didn't really know this. Dave already knew some of our songs. He was a fan, and the energy came. And he was also like really enthusiastic to, to rehearse, you know, every, that was during the time where everybody was getting old, life was starting to, you know, affect a lot of people, you know, we want, Scream was like a band that we believe in practicing like four or five times a week. Damn. We, we took to pretty much like athletes, you know what I mean? The way we approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, back, back, back then, life was a little different, like you said, you could practice four or five times a week, you know? Yeah. Nowadays, I mean, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a band now that rehearses four or five times a year, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, and that, that was the thing. We were like, everybody was writing songs. Everybody, like, wanted to, everybody had their perspective and they wanted to be heard. So yeah. we, we had, to, we had like, even at that time, we probably had like four different sets, four or five different sets. And a lot, of, a lot of the material we didn't even, we ended up never recording and we're always writing stuff. As, as a, That's about as a, 86, 87. As a teenager, uh, when you started playing with Dave, w- was he was he as heavy handed and hard hitting as a teenager? Did oh my god, think- the guy was all yeah. I mean, and really, I remember like because I would rehearse with him, and he was heavy handed and very uh, 
a lot of great dynamics. It's like, you know, he wanted to fill up every space and, and I would just always make him just, we'd get together, just him and I, and we, for hours I'd make him, like we'd be the person just do straight beats, you know what I mean? Right. Right. And, I, and we'd go from, we'd jump from song. He was always enthusiastic. Always. And the great thing about Dave is he also, you know, he played multiple instruments too. So, you know, so and he picked up things so, so quick. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it, and like I said, everybody like is going to try to claim that he, he, he didn't so much lie to Pete and Franz. He never like just put it out there. And you could tell by looking at him, he was fucking, you know, yeah. he had like not The guy looked like he was 15 years old. He looked like he was like he was like he was bucking on fourteen. <laughs> he's, he's about a buck. He's probably like a buck fifty at the time, yeah. you know. Yeah. Now, now this 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 no more censorship sort of uh, this was the wasn't released on um, Discord. Discord. No. This was on Ross Records, right? And yeah. This was the first record with Dave, and and didn't Franz uh, remix this uh, like a. a, a a bunch of yeah, years. 2017. He re he re uh, reamped it, as they say in the mm -hmm. in in that recording world of that that you know that 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 controlled environment. So he reamped it because at the time we recorded this, and uh, I think it was like '87. Ross Records gave us like pretty much unlimited you know time in this studio called. Uh, I think it's called Fox and Hounds in, in Maryland. And so Franz was experimenting with his guitar sound. He used this guitar effect, I think, from the guy in Boston with the Schultz effects. Mm. It's really reverby, really gated, and real thin sounding guitar. Uh, 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 Schultz as in Tom, Tom Schultz, like from uh, <clears throat> Boston? Yeah. Yeah, he had this little module, this little parametric yeah. uh, pedal. I forget what it was called, but Franz pretty much recorded all of our stuff at it with like that. So he, if you if you ever get a chance to listen to this version with Pete on the cover, doing this, uh, with no more censorship. He's used. I forget what's it called, the Rockman. I think it was called. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. Tom Schultz created the Rockman. Rockman and Franz. He ended up, and he also had this other thing called the Art pedal. It was like. ART pedal, yeah. and I think Franz was using a combination of those two pedals, and and Harley was using because Harley's on it. Harley was using pretty much the Marshall straight Marshall with an Equiplex and things like that. So, so I never realized that was Pete on the cover. Yeah, it's Pete. That's right. Pete. But Onam, Onam, Tom, formerly Thomas Ritzy, and uh, Beef Eater, lead singer Beef Eater, his artwork. But uh, yeah, it was just I never. You know, and like, and like in most cases, like, like, like to go back to this, I would always get kicked out of studios after a while because I would, I didn't really un understand how, you know, how everything worked. You know, I'd always ask too much, of, but I would always complain about, you know, like, can can we put this on the bass now? And they'd be like, no, you got to record it like that, dummy. If you don't record it like that, right, <laughs> it's right. too late. You know, it's like, oh. And then, even because I'd see him doing all this stuff with the guitars, you know, and I'd be like, "Oh, what can, what can the guitars do?" Oh, yeah. Even but now, now, it's even, now it's now it's even it's it's way out there now. You could just you can record almost anything, and then they'll yeah. make it sound any way you want, you know. Yeah, but it, but it takes away the essence of like yeah, it's for sure. It's for, for and it's sure. crazy too because uh, I'm glad he he finally went back and changed that sound because. It really just bumped that whole sound of the, that record. It's probably, I wouldn't say it's our, our best work, but like I said, we were like starting to really, you know, get into songwriting and, you know, push the envelope. And the last album, I think, is probably one of the better sounding ones uh, that we recorded with. I mean, we have newer songs, new, newer albums, but the last one on Discord that we recorded. I think it was just going fumble. I don't know if you have that one. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that one. Uh, you got it all. <laughs> that's the probably as far as sound wise and. and I just listened. I just listened to. I revisited this. The, this is, you know, the the record that I really went back and listened to uh, in getting ready for this show, and uh, I think this record's great. What, what what's the history of this record? Wasn't it sort of put on the shelf for for a while? 
Yeah, exactly. It was like, you know, because uh, we record, if I, I, my memory sort of foggy because I was like really, uh, I was in, a, I, I was, you know, the Swiss cheese memory. I was living a whole different lifestyle, of very out of it. But uh, I think we recorded it before before we broke up. Mm-hmm. Uh, which when I left and like before Dave joined Nirvana, right? I think. I think well, I know it, then, like, he he sings a song on this record too. Yeah, right? it was the first. It, this is before Nirvana and everything. And then, and yeah. then we 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 went on. Then I moved to Toronto for a while, mm-hmm. and came back. And we were supposed to, and we went on tour. And then that's when I left in like '89. And then, well, I left them and. And they were, in, I guess we were in LA or in, uh, in Hollywood Hills. And I left, came back home. And then they started about a few months later, he joined Nirvana. And uh, and then fast forward to when, uh, you know, he did Nirvana, he joined Nirvana and Pete and Franz started Wool and they went on touring. I went to, I went to Little Rock and pretty much started my family started you know off and on we but uh and david joined nirvana and we we sort of got back together in 96 and did a reunion show at black cat and we you know because he you know blown up and he, you know and dave came to the show i didn't know he was going to be there and then they talked about you know getting getting together maybe and doing something with that record but then then another i think in 93 that's when kurt OD'd in Italy. He OD'd, and I think, uh, and and so Nirvana had to cancel that tour, and it, it, that, it came that, that that gave him some downtime. Yeah, it gave him some downtime. What Dave did is, he came home and he said, like, well, let's just let's remix this album mm-hmm. and go on tour. So he pretty much came home and took went ahead and financed a tour for Scream with him on drums. I didn't know that. I did yeah, not 90, know. It's, it's somewhere it's a video of uh, us doing. We did a smoke in, the same with the same Yippie organization. Uh-huh, uh-huh. With uh, we did a smoke in, we did, and then we played nine thirty the very next night, and it's a video and recording of that somewhere on this, you know, the great internet. But uh, and, and 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 didn't it wasn't it didn't didn't you guys put out there was a live European thing that he played on too. It's called, yeah, it's like three live European yeah. records that he played on. It's one live at Van Hall, and then it's another one, Your Choice. I don't know if you have that. Uh, Your Choice, and then it's it's one more. I can't think of it right now for some reason. I, have, mm-hmm. I think it's a live album also. Gotcha. Connection here for a while. Okay. Yeah. Your choice, I think, was his name of the live record. And that one was recorded in Germany. Mm-hmm. Is and I'm not it, sure. If, for some reason, I have. I know we recorded another live footage at the Hummingbird in England somewhere. The Hummingbird. But I don't know if that's ever been pulled up and documented or anything. But uh, where was I at? Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Go we got those those live records with Dave, and then in twenty in twenty twenty eleven we got back together, and we ended up doing on uh on uh was it complete control on side one dummies we did we did a right. like an EP I guess it's yeah complete control right I that's it's uh, called yeah on that's side our, one dummies yeah that's yeah. our friend Joe Sib. The comedian, I remember the brain fart. Joe Sib, inside. Yeah, Joe Sib, there yeah, you go, great yeah. guy. Yeah. Comedian, he's a funny guy. That Joe, yo, he, yo, he, yo, he is a funny guy. He's a funny guy. Yeah. So I used to, I used to listen to, you know, with my kid, with my, you know, like with my kid when what? he was like six or seven or eight years old. We lo- we used to in the car. We loved Joe Sib, man. He yeah. Joe Sib was, he's a funny guy. Yeah, yeah, he's just funny guy. Yeah, very talented. He helped us out with that, and that was, you know, not. I thought that was a really good. Record. We recorded that at uh, Dave's studio, you know, six oh six. Right. And then, uh, and then we got a new. The new record's supposed to be out here soon. Should be out here coming, coming um, in the near distant future. The you know, I know that 
you know, Scream, I have a couple, um, you guys are still, I mean, even, even fairly recently, here's a, uh, is this, you guys kind of out, uh, in Europe, is this with Soulside? Yeah, we played, we did a festival to support the uh, Ukrainian refugees, a festival in a town called Lublin. Uh, oh, Lu Lublin, Lublin, Poland? Oh, correct. Yeah, I've been there, man. I know yeah, this place. Yeah, it's a great little, little old village. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, ancient, ancient village. And yeah. uh, so, so and, uh, and I knew Soulside and, 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 and Boys versus Girls were, which is the soul side with Eli, who's far left above above the guy center, who's far left with the shades on. And then Bobby Sullivan is right next to Eli. It's just boys versus girls is just omit Bobby and put in Eli. And that's boys versus girls. So and it was wild. I knew I knew that Soul Side was going to be there, but I didn't know Eli. Eli was actually the uh engineer of the fumble album. Wow. He's and he's also Eli's. He's uh, he's this. He, he's the music director or sound director of the late night show. The late late night shot, with shot it. from Poland, by the way. Yeah, that was a great yeah, great yeah. great Is venue it, outdoors. All Big. these years, all these years later, um, it must be nice to be able to go a place. Uh, like go to a place like Poland for Scream and, and be appreciated? Oh, absolutely. Never yeah. in my wildest dreams. I mean, of course, yeah. I wanted to be like, like I said, I've always wanted to be like, you know, I don't know, rock guy. I always want to be in the limelight of like rock and roll music or whatever. And uh, yeah, and, it's, and, and, you know, and a lot of people, might say that they knew it, but I had no idea that it'd still be appreciated. You know, sure. at a certain point, you know, sure. At a certain point, you just do you're just doing it out of love and yeah. <laughs> and just and just living. You know, I see. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, I see that you guys are pay, playing the punk rock holiday in August yeah. in Slovenia. Slovenia. With, what's up? Yeah. What's up, Slovenia? And, yeah, uh, right with, with our friends, with our good friends, Agnostic Front. I uh, awesome. see H two O's on the bill. Yeah, uh, Booze and Glory. Um, you know it, this Slo it's a lot, it's a lot. Slovenia. Who would have thought? Yeah, who would have thought? That's what. Dude, it's like we were talking earlier. It's like all the punk is everywhere. Yeah. Punk's not dead. I mean, not in hardcore, Slovenia, right? Hardcore yeah. punk rock. You know, music is not dead at all in every genre, really. It's really yeah. bustling. That's that's great to be able to travel to a place like that and get some love yeah. and, and be appreciated, you know? To be appreciated. And then you come back to your regular life. And then, yeah, and then you get on the train and, and you're like, you know, you got to watch your back. And like, <laughs> yeah. I've, le I've learned to savor that, you know? It well, used oh, to, yeah. It, it used to upset me, but now I just like, I, 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 I bask in the glory of like, one second oh. you're like entertaining the multitudes, and the next second you're like worrying about getting stabbed on the New York City subway. You know? Yeah, well, I, I don't have a, what I have is like trying to make the bills and just meet meet, <laughs> meet, <laughs> meet the next bill. You get home and you live that lavish life, and you go like, "Oh, that's right, I got bills yeah. like last yeah. when I get home." Hey, how's uh, I can do the chat letter too? <laughs> how's cat? Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't need to eat, but we need cat litter. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I I know Kent is having some some uh, health struggles. What's happening with Kent these days? Kent is like uh, he was diagnosed with stage three lung cancer. Mm. Fuck cancer, cancer is pretty brutal, yep. but he's coming along pretty good. He's done all the uh, you know chemo and uh, and everything, and he's you know he's coming around. He's on the mend. He seems to be going. Good. I'm sure he has good days and bad days because the cancer is a fucking beast. And uh and but so is Ken Stacks. Yeah. He's a very humble, peaceful warrior and he's, he's fighting it every and we're supporting him every every way we can. You know, one of the incredible things about Scream at, at this stage of the game is it's the same original four guys that pretty much started the band in month in exactly. I mean that that's unheard of. You know, yeah. in, in any genre, is yeah. that the four guys in Scream now are the four guys that were in Scream in 1981. Yeah. 
Exact same guys, same guys. A little, little uh, more gray hair and a couple more pounds here and there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and that's and that goes. I mean, we. I think. Well, how about the Knox in front? Isn't that the same band? No, it's just Vinny and Roger. V- Vinny and Roger, only two. Yeah, yeah. So it's been, that's right. It's been so long since I've actually seen him play. I've just it's, seen it's, him. it's Vinny Stigma and Roger Moret. It's yeah. those th- those two guys. Yeah, and then, you know. Mike Allen's been playing bass for 20 years or whatever, but you know. Yeah, yeah but they're not too. Real. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's like so weird. The band, the dynamics of bands are just yeah. And yeah just to band, carry on bands, is enough. Most bands are not. I think the Descendants are like maybe one guy, you know that. that but With Milo. Bands, no, no, one guy that hasn't wasn't there in the beginning. I think. Yeah. But but. Most, most, most. Oh, uh, yeah. I thought everybody else was a, it's original. Yeah. It's not the original. Uh, Stevenson's original drummer. Yes. Hey, I, I'll put this out there. Anybody, anybody out there, hardcore bands are just still playing with the same lineup. Hmm. That is. <laughs> Here they come. Hey, I want to, th- hey, looking out. Thanks for the, for the, for the super chat. If you have a question, uh, super, anybody who does a super chat, <laughs> Uh, get, gets goes right to the front of the line with a question. So if you got yeah. a question, and yo, I see Ray Hogan. We'll, we'll get to your question when when we come back when we come back from the break. But let, let's see if anybody, um, yeah, Carl and Carl and Stefan are original, right? And Milo's original, right? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, yeah, Stefan is definitely original. Yeah, right. Milo is definitely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that uh, helped. They're original, right? Right. They say, oh, he's saying Drew's saying that or not. Cox uh, Bar. Oh, oh, Youth Brigade. Youth Brigade is all the, is all the original. Yeah, brothers. the brothers. Yeah, that's right. The brothers, right, right. Co- oh, cool. Bill, Bob Riley. Of course, Bob Riley, Ch- Cox Bar, except yeah. one guy. That's him and cool. Kent. See, that's him and Kent. That's Kent's favorite band. Yeah. Cox Bar. Yeah. Oh. Hey, I love Boy. Yeah. I love, I, I, Agent I Orange. Have. I don't know. I don't think Agent Orange has had a couple guys in there. No. Yeah. Dan today, East, today, today, it depends on which youth of today this what's up dan a, there's been a bunch of lineups you know a, a youth youth today. As, i mean that's a, i mean it, is that right milo wasn't an original member of the descendants their first seven inch was done as a trio i did not know I, that i did not know that so, like i said i'm more of i'm more of i'm not I'm, i never know the inside outside of the band you know like all the yeah yeah intricate details yeah yeah yeah. I just either like the band or don't. Hey, Roberto, Roberto West says, hey, I am from Brazil. I would like to express my gratitude for your influence. A few years ago, I bought the vinyl of Scream, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mucho gracias. Well, I yeah. guess it's not God. How do you say it in uh, Portuguese? Ooh, God, I don't know. Yeah, don't, I don't know. That one I'm I don't bad. know. I'm bad yeah. with lingo. and Bad with English, even. Yeah. But I appreciate that, Roberto. Yeah, yep. Hey, Which, let's uh, uh, let, let me take um, let me take my last sponsor break here. It's, it's a quick one, and we'll come back and we'll take questions from around the world. Okay. Okay. God bless. All right. That's right. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Upstate Records, and. 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself for years. They experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game. www.126clothing.com. Once again, that said, please support the show. I appreciate the super chats. Uh, your questions will go right right to the front of the line. Any questions you have for our guest, Mr. Skeeter Enoch Thompson, please, uh, from Scream, uh, post up some questions. Uh, don't be scared. Be creative. Um, what else? Uh, I already mentioned uh, a week from today is uh, filmmaker Danny Garcia. Uh, he directed The Rise and Fall of the Clash. Stiv, Looking for Johnny, the Johnny Thunders film, which I enjoyed very much. Rolling Stone, The Life and Death of Brian Jones. And he has a new film that just came out called Night Clubbing, Night Clubbing, The Birth of Punk Rock in New York City. We always love when we have 
filmmakers on. And then, of course, a couple of days later, show uh, 249 with Louis Vito and then 250 with Lars from Rancid. And then, of course, don't forget that this Sunday down at the Bowery Electric, if it's free, it's for me. Two-man advantage, Enziguri, non-residents, icon aside, fuck it, I quit, and DJ Spike Polite. So a lot going on. Um, I think I mentioned everything else. Uh, yeah. Let's see what um, what questions we have. Um, here we go. Let's bring our guests back on. Post your questions. Hey, man. Hey, hey. So let's see. Um, okay, here we go. Um, basis, in, this is from Jeff Kaplan, our, our friend and supporter who is uh, in uh, Two Man Advantage. Bassists and drummers have to connect. Kent and Dave were both amazing drummers, but very different. How did Skeeter change his approach, if at all, when Dave joined? Uh, well, well, Kent is definitely more more fluid and jazzier type. He doesn't pound as much. Mm. And the approach is like with Kent. I'm, like I said, I've known Kent since we second grade, so we have sort of like a love hate relationship. But with uh, it's easier to it's easy to work with Kent with, in that regard because I know him so well. I didn't have don't really have to change much of anything. But with Dave uh, was just the, the approach I used with Dave was uh, trying to minimizing. He had it at first. He yeah he he would he had a lot of bad habits at first playing. Mm. You know you, you know. Tempo was all over the place, and it's <laughs> you know he was. I, I don't think it was his first instrument. It's, it's a thing. Kent, you know, Kent was an accomplished drummer. His tempos, he's like a train. We always say he's like an engine. And Dave I, I played. His bands always play with a lot of emotions and a lot of fluctuation and, and, and uh, a lot of power. You know, but and the dynamics were just in, in the power side. So. Just trying to talk to him about dynamics and were more about like that. Kent knew more about dynamics, so I think Dave wasn't really in, into that. Like hi hat techniques and things like that, flams and paradiddles, which he learned from Kent. And Kent gave him a little bit because Kent's a really, you know, he knows his, his jargon. So Kent was the one to help him. But Dave was easy. And both of them is easy because they're both, you know, Kent's a little more stubborn. You can't really tell Kent what to do. He'll figure it out at his own pace. Right. Dave is a lot more that sort of go-getter and you know, like over doing. You always have to tell him to back it up. Kent's a little more cautious. He sort of creeps into things. Dave gets all over it. So it was always just a matter of like, you know, like Dave, I always have to tell Dave to breathe when he first yeah. started. Sure. Because I remember the first time he played. It's, it's because what's it, it you know, it's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. music has a lot lot to do with the, the notes you don't hear, the ghost right. notes, as they say. That's right. And like, I remember the first time he ever played with us uh, when Kent supposedly handed over the baton, as to say, he just played one song, it was a song we got called Walking By Myself, and we're playing St. Stevens, I believe, on the floor with everybody's packed house, everybody's there to see the changeover and everything. And we're doing walking by myself, and it has this intro, great intro with the snare, like you know, black, 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 and flams, you know. Mm -hmm. And it has like a two, two measure intro or measure. Then the guitar comes in, and when the guitar kicked in, he just started to get faster and faster, you know, mm -hmm. and he got faster and faster, faster. It's already a pretty fast song. I looked over at him, and I noticed he's turning bleak red, and I was, like, and it was already too fast. So if we would have started, it would have been. Way too fast, and Pete's like a fucking. He would have jumped all over us right there. So I, I, it was his first time. So I just stopped him, and I said, "Dave." And he looked at me, and I said, like, "No, no, 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 Dave." And he was like, and he, he was so pissed that I stopped him. And I was like, "Dave, breathe." And and that was like the only time I had, I had like ever had to stop him or you know give him any sort of real critique. And that was the main thing is to say, breathe, don't overthink things. Sure. He's a very, he's a very, uh, what do you, 
Well, Kent's like a machine. Like I say, he'll go cautiously. Anything Dave will jump in at both feet. <laughs> anything you write, it gives to him. Uh, uh, Damian Weber asked, bass influences, like uh, big bass influences? Really, dude, I'm sort of like a, I would still say yeah, Daryl Jennifer is like probably my biggest influence. That was the one I watched up close play. Sure. You know, James Jameson and Soulfulness and, you know, of course, yeah, yeah. Billy Clark and people like that. Yeah, yeah. But I must also say, but, you know, I really love the root notes of like, I don't know what's you know in love. What's what's the guy from Sabbath? Uh, Geezer, Geezer Butler. Butler. Geezer, I love Geezer. I mean, I love those are all, all great rock and foot. And even like even though he's not really a bass player, when I watch interviews with him, No Redding did some great stuff. Yeah, yeah. With Jack Bruce, all those guys. I, I, I take a little. I steal a little. I mean, I steal a little bit from everybody. Anything yeah. I can come close to, even the stuff I can't do, like I watch Victor Wooten, his little short, short little steppy fingers do these amazing things, and <laughs> and, and I yeah. just I just had an awe of and just try. Those are my influences. Just about a little bit. I'm finding them more every day. <laughs> Let me ask you. Uh, I, I have this shot here uh, with Andy, Andy uh, Rappaport, Danny. Uh, is it Danny Ingram and Bobby Madison? Uh, DC, yeah. yeah, DC. Tell us about this project here. What's going on here? Oh, this is uh, we were doing a tribute for for Joe Strummer. Oh, nice. We, do, we I do a tribute for Joe Strummer. Uh, uh -huh. His birthday is uh, August twenty first, I believe. We do a little tribute to him every year at a club. Sure. DC sure. called uh, Danish. Dangerously Delicious Pies. Mm -hmm. And so we got together with a moment's notice. <laughs> yeah. And did all we do is clash covers. And we were called nice. Pete, Pete Stahl came along and did, you know, we did like, what did we do? Like, you know, yeah, European homes and and we didn't do the huge and clamp down and things like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We didn't do like any of the, the more pop songs, but we just, just a tribute band to Joe Strummer. Yep, right on. Yeah. Uh, Andy Rappaport from Kingface, sure. and, and Danny Ingram's in Dot yeah, Dot Dash. It's a new band. He was in Youth Brigade, and yeah, and we got what? What other band was he in? Oh, that's, Strange Boutique. That's, that's first wave of DC hardcore Youth Brigade, oh, yeah. and you know. Oh. Uh, here's a question. Um, uh, our good friend Flora asks. Um, and I have a photo to go with it. Uh, can you talk about Rise Defy and how that band came about? Okay, Rise Defy is uh, the guy in the middle is a guy named Dave Stone. Mm -hmm. see, see my years of like moving around all over the country and, uh, and I ended up moving in a place in Virginia called Reston, Virginia, which is this uh, community. It was built by this guy, last name is Smith. I can't remember his first name, but this community built with like upscale, the whole dichotomy of America, you know, rich, poor, middle class, Section 8, you know, foreign, Russians, Ukrainians, everything. So I moved to this community and I met those guys. Uh, the guy in the middle of Dave Stone, the guy on the left is a guy named Ben, call him Van, uh, Van Ghazi. And, uh, and I met those guys. They played in a band called BSR, Basic Skills Review. And just met those guys. And, and they had this, I, I sang for that band a little bit for one show. And, and I would always go, go to their shows. But then Dave started this band, uh, Rise to Fire. And it was like all his originals. And, and, yeah. and I loved the stuff when I first heard it. Well, well sort of. Different sort of, you know, but not but not different sort of you know, real real familiar um, sort of a pop sound. And uh he came to me and asked if I would play bass for him because uh his bass player moved out of town. And I was like, Yeah, sure. And I love the stuff and I played bass, but you know, I've always wanted to get back on guitar. Mm. And uh and I was like, dude, you know, I got what would you think about having a guitarist, a second guitarist? And he went for the idea and 
the rest is history. So yeah, I've been playing for them for like the last three years off, you know, three years about. We're still building everything. It's a great band, great, you know, four piece band. And 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 what is what is the sky uh, the sky church talent review? Is that the open mic thing that you that you, that, that you do yeah. at, at Paulie's where you are? Explain to everybody what's going on there. Well, when I got here, I was doing the pandemic, and uh, and you know, one of the, one of the things I wanted to do anywhere I go is to start a band. <laughs> regards and meet the musicians and uh, I was going to a lot of open mics around here and I ended up coming to Paulie's playing. I played in a sort of a Hendrix tribute band with this guy named Tony, Tony Berkeley, Burke star. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we played here and I noticed it, it just sort of reminded me, I had that feeling of the DC, like the same uh, earlier venues that we started to play in uh, when we first started, you know, and uh, had a great liking for it, and I, and I talked to the proprietor and asked him if you know, he'd be, if he had an open mic, and he didn't have one. And I always, you know, wanted to host open mic, and wanted to build it mainly on a community of uh, trying to get musicians together and, and and sort of talk about the get on the, you know, sort of current events that are really plaguing our society, which is like mental health and homelessness and. So we're trying to like attract people with great amount of talent. Hmm. You know, it might be sort of where is it, is it literally an open mic thing? Like anybody could show up? Anybody. It's an open, it's a regular open mic where, where a lot of open mics they try to go like, okay, we're either gonna do no recorded music, let's say, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You gotta do just blues. Sure, sure. Or you can't, you know, you gotta do just poets sometimes, just do poetry slams. So we, we I decided to do like all those things combined into one and call it like a, and I'm still in the name from uh, Jimi Hendrix. He had a band, one of his last bands they wanted yeah. to get together was a band he called, you know, Electric Sky Church. That's right. And, and that so, was like him and like Juma Sultan on percussion. Yeah. And like, and like, um, that's the uh, one that did the Star Spangled Banner. That was no and Je Jerry Vasquez, uh, Vasquez on, per on, on percussion and yeah. Billy Cox. Right, Billy Cox on bass, Mitch Mitchell, and, 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 and Mitch Mitchell playing drums. He, yeah, it was another guitar Hendrick, player. It was another guitar player too, but I can't remember. Larry that. Lee. Yeah, Larry Lee. He's a left hand. It was like a left handed. Was it Larry left Lee? A lot of people don't know that Larry Lee played second guitar with Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. Yeah, it, exactly. During the Star Spangled Banner, yeah, it's pretty much the same, same sort of. And, and so I took that name because I got a great love of Hendrix. Yeah, and, and I love the Hendrix too. sort of like sort of loosey goosey way he was. He never, yeah. he never put a finger on it. And so, you know, I decided to call out poets and dancers and, and it started out really slow, but it's starting to pick up really well now. It's a lot of great talent, like everywhere in the world. What, what night of the week do you do it? On Sunday, the fr yeah, Sundays, you know, yeah. so that's why we call it church. We put it because most, sure. we try to make it so, so it's, what I've noticed that a lot of open mics, you hear a lot of like, uh, I don't know if you, it's a lot of cover songs and she's like a simple man and songs <laughs> like, you know, stuff like that. But what, what, what we're it's bringing back simple. is a lot of renditioning of like Curtis Mayfield type stuff and, you know, uh, you know, old soul and earth, wind and fire. We're trying to do the more elaborate bands, you know, and we're trying in you know, punk, of course, just to like to mess with people's heads and we're, trying to make a safe place for the LGBTQ community and gays and lesbians and, you know, black and brown, whites and everything. Everybody's, everybody's welcome. Yeah. Come as you are, as they say. Yeah. Hey, what is, uh, what's jamming at 606? What is that? Jamming at 606. That's, it's actually, we still, it's a jam, it's a bad brain song. It's got jamming, jamming at Atlantis. Ah. And we were doing it at 606. We, you know, Dave let us, record there so we were like just showing homage to Dave at the same time and, and of course the bad brain because that's our band we always try to represent you know and like you were talking earlier like bad brains like just changed my life it got me to, so like even like his history wise even you know taught me like you know well you know got you into like looking into your culture and looking inside yourself so that was you know Babylon talking about ancient stuff, you know, there and, and then they had the whole 
you know, it was just a great time we we had. Well, I, 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 and musically, one thing that 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 I remember is sort of the incredible dynamics when you go see them play. They would do like a blistering, couple blistering triple speed hardcore songs, yeah. and then they would do like a reggae song, and everything would sort of settle down, and everybody oh, would catch catch their breath. Yeah. And then the, the reggae, reggae soul would sort of fade away, and then everybody would just be like, "All right, let's ready, go. Yeah. You're ready, ready to get it popping, Jack." Yeah, that right? was nice. Yeah, those, those were those were good times. Fabric yeah. eighty one, eighty two. That was the back in the days when people would fall down, we pick them up. That's right. Yeah, that was That's the right. days, man. Yeah. And people, I mean, I try to explain to people the, the energy. Like the people have seen the bad brains, like the you know, you know, the sort of like. Later years, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to explain to them. They go, they, yeah. When they go like, yeah. Dude, no, that guy, that guy is still, he still got it somewhere in there, and the guy still played great. <laughs> now that Gary, I haven't seen Gary or anything for, but I heard he, he had, a, you know, he had some medical issues, but yeah. you know, even even at the that. even at that point, they were still yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I saw a couple of shows in the 2000s that was still like yep. when he wasn't singing or anything, but he was still just amazing. Sure, sure. Well, hey, listen, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it, it was great. Thanks it was for great having me. It, it was great uh, chopping it up with you. And, uh, you know, you, of course, you're welcome back anytime. Anybody you want to thank or shout out? I want to thank uh, God. Thank Flora. As always, all my people, Adam and him, uh, Pete Franz, of course. Kent, of course, the mighty Kent stacks get well, baby. Hope to see everybody soon. Oh, yeah, we're going to shout out. We're playing a show on June 18th down in D.C. Uh, to hopefully release. Uh, we're not sure who else is going to play, but it's going to be a lot of other great D.C. bands to support uh, a book that's coming out on Inner Ear, about Inner Ear, about, you know, so. And I like to say hello to my family, I guess, Every, the DC family folks, and and hope that one day that uh, we all get together and play a lot more music. Right on. Yeah, Thanks, man. Skeeter, and, and uh, thank Mary for me, and we'll talk soon. Okay, God bless, man. Ciao, God bless. Take yeah, care. Sure. Bye-bye. There you have it. Nice show today with our old friend uh, Enoch uh, Thompson. That was That was really nice. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, that said, um, June 10th, is that right? That's what, that's what it is. June, June 10th. Uh, thanks for tuning in everybody, Flora and Ray Hogan and, and everybody else. Uh, great show looking out. Uh, thanks for coming by. Uh, thank, thanks for the super chat and, and, and all that. Uh, thank you, Flora. And, uh, looking forward to seeing you, uh, at, at the, uh, at the event at, uh, at uh, Generation Records, of course. Bob Riley, listen, what can I tell you, bro? You know what we didn't get into? Troy, New York. We've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. <laughs> we, we we didn't we we didn't we didn't go there. You know, um, what's going on, Riley? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Larry Kelly, of course, man. You know, a um, yeah, good guy. Really nice guy. We've been doing good shows lately. You know? Very, I'm very fortunate. Very, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to, to do this show, and I appreciate it. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, Lex. Um, what else? I'm going to Florida. Um, spend a couple days down there uh, with my dad. Uh, my dad's struggling a bit. Um but, uh, you know, I'm meeting my brother down there. We're going to spend some time with him. And I will be back on Sunday uh, for the Bowery Electric Show uh, at, uh, you know, that's going on in New York. My, my pleasure. My pleasure, John. Jonathan, you know. Um, what else? Did I mention? Did I mention? I think I did mention, but I'll mention again. Uh, I'm not going to jump up. We'll do a couple more minutes. Um just announced that we have Theo from the Lunachicks coming on on Sunday, May 7th. And we have Kira uh, from Black Flag. Uh, Dose, you know, the group she was in with her husband at the time, Mike Watt. Twisted Roots. Um, 
her solo career, and, and she's a sound engineer. Like I said, she worked on Mad Max Fury Road, which won an Oscar. And I'm looking forward. This show is going to be co-hosted by Joel Ghostin, who I, I enjoy uh, co-hosting with. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, right. The Moby Doc was good, right? I said it before. I'll say it again. Um, I really enjoyed the Moby Doc. Um, listen, even if you're not a vegan, there's a lot of great punk and hardcore history in the Moby Doc. So check it, check it out. Uh, yes, that's Paul's sister. Right. And we had Paul on the show recently. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Regarding my dad. Um, so that's it. Um, am I forget? Why do I feel like I'm forgetting something? Um, what else? There's um, the Paris Mayhew event, which is March 11th at, at uh, uh, Saturday at Generation Records. Come through um, and check that out. Uh, the only time I ever saw two shows in one night was Halloween 92, MOD at the Limelight, and Murphy's Law at, at Tilt Rocks. Yeah, Luna Chicks. Yeah, they came out wearing strap-on dildos. Oh, my. Listen, even if you're not vegan, you can watch the, the Moby Doc. Don't be scared. It's on YouTube. We put it on YouTube for free. You know? So, there you go. Hey, that's me on the, on the left of what? What are you on the left of? Um, that said, uh, what else? Shout, yo, you know what? One more time. One more time. Why not? Support the show on Patreon. We must continue in our quest <laughs> to continue doing this great show. Uh, thank you, uh, Stefan Sonic, uh, Jeff Steiner, Brenda Murray, uh, Marla Standing Isle, uh, uh, Standing Owl. Um, join on Patreon. I wanted to pull out, I found a bunch of t-shirts that I want to offer to patrons for free. I got to dig them out. A bunch of New York Hardcore Chronicles uh, film shirts and A7 shirts. I, I got to dig those out and, and, and offer them out. Um, documenting all these parts of our musical culture and history is so important. Thanks for your work, Drew, praying over your dad. Thank you very much, Flora. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I, I, and, I do believe that uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, I said this a while ago that, you know, uh, this is important stuff. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is important cultural stuff, and uh, it should be documented. Um, and that's what I've been striving to do for many years now. Um, so, so there you go. That said, thanks a lot for stopping by, everybody. I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, until I see you again, maybe on Sunday, maybe a, a week from today right here, do good things and good things will come. <laughs>